Hi there, I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for being here for another Theory of Change program. We've got an, an interesting topic here as always. Um, so uh, please do um, make sure to subscribe um, on YouTube or on your audio platform that you're listening on. So um, thank you for that. And then um, I also wanted to let you know that Theory of Change is part of the Flux.community media network, which is a new organization uh, bringing together content creators to make articles and podcasts um, about religion, politics, media, and technology, and how they all intersect, and what the broader trends within each realm are. So you can visit us at Flux.community, and uh, we also have a mailing list there you can sign up for as well. And then if you want to go through the Theory of Change archives, uh, read transcripts or watch videos or um, audio, um, you can do that. You can go directly to the Theory of Change section on Flux by going to theoryofchange.show, and you'll be redirected right to where you need to go. And of course, if you have enjoyed what you're seeing here, um, you can, I definitely would appreciate it if you could go down to, uh, go over to patreon.com slash discover flux. So thank you for that. All right. Well, with that little housekeeping out of the way, oh, and I did want to say thank you also to everybody who does support us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. We don't have any billionaire uh, George Soros or, or Koch brothers money here. Um, so we definitely need your support to keep going here. All right, so uh, let's get into the program here. As we head into the 2022 midterm elections and further on into the 2024 presidential election, one of the hottest topics among political strategists is where do Latino voters fit into the equation? Things are different in many regards um, there was a lot of change with regard to Latino voters in the 2020 presidential election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Biden won 69% of college-degreed Latino voters compared to 30% for Trump. That was a 39% uh, percentage point advantage. But among Hispanics with who did not have a college degree, Biden won 55% to 41%, a 14% advantage. So there's been a lot of talk about an educational divide among Latinos, uh, but it's also the case that there are some religious divides as well. And that's a question that unfortunately is not covered very adequately in a lot of public opinion surveys. Um, and there are reasons for that, which we'll perhaps talk about uh, today. Uh, but I did want to, um, so there, there's a lot of dynamics here. There's um, difficulties with uh, polling Latinos in terms of language uh, barriers or uh, work availability and things like that. Um, so, but also there are important religious differences um, and there is a significant white evangelical outreach program to Latino Protestants as well. So to help me talk about all this today, um, I am bringing in Gerardo Marti. He is a professor of sociology at Davidson College. Um, he studies race, religion, and social change. And uh, before that, uh, at, uh, he, and he got his PhD from the University of Southern California. So thanks for being here, Gerardo. Thanks, my pleasure. All right, well, so um, the discussion that we're gonna have today, um, we're going to focus it around an article that you wrote, and uh, I will uh, provide a a link in the show notes for everybody who wants to check it out. Uh, but uh, you wrote a, a piece in the uh, Journal of uh, Sociology of Religion, and uh, your your article was about um, some of the religious um, aspects of, of, of uh, Latino Americans and whether or not uh, Protestant Americans uh, or Protestants in the various Latino communities have different political opinions. Um, so let's maybe uh, walk through a little bit about some of the key points in your article. What's your overall contention? Well, thanks for having me. We know that the proportion of Protestants among Latinos has grown tremendously uh, in recent years. It's one of the most dramatic shifts happening among Latinos in the United States. And so most people have been just trying to pay attention to what is that difference, to what extent are 
Protestants different than Catholics? To what proportion uh, are the Protestants just really Pentecostals? And what consequences is that having for uh, church, uh, the demographics of church life? Because we also are seeing a rise in religious nuns. And of course, we're also seeing the fact that church membership and church attendance overall has declined. So is perhaps um, Latino Christianity one of the most vibrant aspects of Christianity in the United States? And that's a question that I've been pursuing for quite a while. Um, but it was since the Trump presidency that I began to pay a lot more attention to the politics of Latino Protestants and to begin to see what, to what extent do we see Latino Protestants as resonating with their white um, Christian, especially white evangelical brethren. And by being able to take a look at that, um, we immediately run into difficulties. So even though I and colleagues have been spending time in congregations, in communities across the United States to really get an on the ground look at what they are doing, to be able to get macro views uh, based on survey data or even polling data to actually measure what's going on, uh, this becomes very, very difficult uh, because we actually have too few that are measured and to be able to make a distinction between Latinos on the basis of their religious orientation. So the essay that I wrote was an attempt to focus more directly on um, does the growth of Latino Protestants in the United States have religious uh, consequences for their vote? And what we see is, yes, first, we need to be able to look more carefully at the history of colonization and the border issues that have translated into what does it mean to be a Latino in the United States and what kinds of people are coming into the United States and therefore what do they adopt? And when we begin to see all of these things together, we find that Latinos overall are seeming to resonate with a kind of family politics that is characteristic of the conservative right. And that family politics, which really resonates with stereotypes about Latinos who care about family and are family oriented and family centered, seem to also dovetail with their being mostly against the agenda on uh, homosexuality, uh, trans or gay rights kind of things. And they also tend to be uh, anti-abortion as a whole. So when you see a connection then between the growth in their churches um, in terms of Latino Protestants, especially Latino evangelicals and Pentecostals, and we see the resonances that they have with certain social attitudes, what we're increasingly seeing is that all of that seems to be aligning with support for Donald Trump. And this becomes a surprise because most people believe that Donald Trump's words and the kinds of things that he had advocated about the wall, about immigration, about the kinds of discriminatory things um, that he had said that created a lot of reactions, that still you have a significant proportions of Latinos who still resonate with the policies being proposed um, by uh, Trump and the GOP. Uh, so uh, in 2016 and in 2020, what we saw is indeed an increase in Latino Protestants giving their vote over to Donald Trump and that this needs to be explained over and beyond um, the Latinos who are Cuban or Venezuelan, which in popular terms, um, that people believe that their anti-communism automatically translates into a vote for the GOP. But actually, it doesn't account for uh, significant votes and support that's going from Latino populations that are not Cuban or Venezuelan in other states, uh, in other places outside of like Florida. So when we look at those things more carefully, what we need to do is pay more attention at a distinction of religious orientation among Latinos and to be able to look specifically at what is the religious orientation and the networks that they're a part of feeding into in terms of the politics that they take on and ultimately uh, the vote that they'll support. Mm -hmm. um, and so just real quick, um, let's maybe discuss like the difference that you saw in terms of uh, the, you know, the actual vote totals and, and some of the polling uh, differences between uh, Latino Catholics and, and Protestants. So when we look specifically, uh, we, we have scarce information that we can draw on. Uh, but the little bit that we have is that even though we don't see um, entirely uh, always majority Latino Protestants, the best information that I have most recently is showing that in 2020, the majority of Latino Protestants did indeed vote for Donald Trump. 
maybe if it's just over 50%, maybe 55%, it still becomes a majority that is washed out when you only look at the Latino vote as a whole. Now, we do see that um, conservatism, generally speaking, among everyone, including Latinos, will predict that vote. So that if a Latino somehow resonates with conservatism, then you're going to get that vote. But it still doesn't explain where that conservatism comes from and what supports it. Um, is it just uh, those people who are able to have more edu uh, more education in some way? Well, we don't see that. Is it home ownership, the ability to have property and assets? Um, yes, there's some indication that that indeed has a positive inflection. But Protestantism is a powerful point of explanation for Latino support for Donald Trump. And that the more that they attend church, the more you see them immersed in a congregational community, the more you see their support uh, aligned with uh, a Trump vote. So what does that mean for the future? Well, we're all still trying to figure out, um, but I think that it shows an alliance, an aligning, if you will, between um, the Latino or the Hispanic uh, Protestant vote and the initiatives that are being proposed as policy by the GOP. And that's measured by other factors like, um, generally speaking, Hispanic evangelicals, as measured by PRRI in particular, are the ones who are the most against uh, open immigration policies. They are the ones who express the least amount of resistance to um, the uh, confinement of children uh, across the border or the separation of parents from their children. Uh, they're the ones who are who tend to most agree uh, that um, immigrants are somehow hurting our country or the the culture of the united states they're changing the culture of the united states and so the surprise there is that you have hispanic evangelicals who are being the closest um, with aligning with their white evangelical brethren and so if we now see white evangelicals as sort of the vanguard or the largest group that expresses the most intense support for the Trump presidency and different policies that are coming through, then we should now be paying attention also to those um, Hispanics or Latinos who also seem to be tracking with that and aligning with them, even if the proportion is smaller, in places where the vote is razor thin, those small margins are going to make a difference. And indeed, I think they have. Yeah, well, and, and, and there's just, there's a lot of complexity to the picture here. Um, so in terms of the, the particular religious denominations of Protestantism that we're talking about here. Um, so it's, you know, as you, as you noted, the, the um, similarities between uh, Hispanic Protestants and, and, and white Protestant evangelical Protestants. Um, but, you know, so what, what particular Protestant denominations are we talking about here that have grown uh, among Latinos? Well, this becomes a little bit harder to measure because we don't have the greatest data. But generally speaking, the greatest growth, the most vibrant area of American religious life in terms of Christianity today uh, is non-denominational, independent evangelical churches. Um, these are churches that either are non-denominational or act non-denominational and take their cues from the more successful, uh, media-friendly, uh, pop culture-friendly, uh, a sort of mega church model that's there. And all this has roots in history. Um, a colleague and I have written a lot about Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral, um, the guy behind the Hour of Power uh, for the model that he established um, in the mid 20th century and how that model then influenced people like uh, Rick Warren and uh, Bill Hybels and Willow Creek and even Joel Osteen in, in Houston. So these are the kinds of models that have been embedded uh, for a long time. But what they have said is that they are not political. They claim to be apolitical largely, even though they support uh, very conservative policies and by and large um, uh, support things like voter guides or have been able to promote people into political office who share these kinds of resonances. Now, when we take a look at the Hispanic or the Latino vote, um, the majority of Latino Protestants are evangelical and about half of those are Pentecostal and half are um, sort of like, I call them Baptistic, you know, they're non-charismatic evangelicals. In terms of where they are coming from, it's very hard to tell. The Pentecostals have a much more fluid model. 
And because of historic discrimination among Pentecostal uh, denominations, you have some who are aligned with things like um, uh, the uh, AOG, the Assemblies of God, uh, or maybe Foursquare. But, uh, but a lot of Pentecostal Latinos are sort of self-anointed, self-appointed independent congregations that are meeting in homes or in schools or, you know, empty buildings um, that may not necessarily have a sign, but are able to sustain themselves over time. Uh, those who are um, not necessarily Pentecostal, they may affiliate with places who are willing to give them money. And so that means that they may occupy a Sunday school classroom in a church, or they may meet at a different time of the day um, and are willing to rent or be donated that space in an established building. And those that are fully independent might actually uh, align with uh, any number of different denominations who want to have some kind of outreach or touch with the Latino or Hispanic population, perhaps even if it's Spanish speaking or Spanish only. Um, we are going to have the smallest proportion of those among the mainline. And that's because Latino leadership in mainline is still often uh, tied to the requirements of education in order to be ordained as a Methodist or as a uh, many of the Lutherans or Presbyterians, you have to be able to have credentials. Those credentials mean that you're going to have to have um, a path of being able to go through schooling and seminary. And the fact of the matter is, is that Latinos in America have, um, have uh, higher rates of dropout in high school. They have lower rates of attainment in terms of college, let alone being able to pursue formal schooling uh, for ministry. So the path of ministry ends up being those who are immersed in a church are successful and have done a great deal of ministry and they are recruited from their church leadership or the denominational leadership to take on these roles and might be able to find their way into education. But it only translates to maybe 10, 15 percent at most mm -hmm. of Latino Protestants being from a mainline denomination, some of the bigger ticket you know denominations that we might recognize in the united states yeah well and and i think that does the issue you talk about with regard to uh credentialism if you will um you know th that is kind of the if you look at kind of a, a lot of the maybe the emotional underlying appeal of a lot of republican politicking it also plays into that as well that You've got these, this, you know, educated globalist elite, and they don't care about you. Um, you know, they're not open to you. Uh, and, you know, they look down on people who don't have a college degree. And so it, Republican politics has, has focused, uh, has, has come up with a model of elite, you know, or populism, we'll say, come up with a populist model, which is not economic based because you know, their policies are for lower taxes on wealthy people and, and, and less regulations on business and opposing minimum wage and things like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, they've, they've managed to reorient the focus of a lot of people to say that, well, the real elites in America are actually uh, college professors like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think what's interesting is I take a look at things usually through a congregational lens, and that just has to do with uh, both the interest, the past research that I've done, and the kinds of things that I typically pay attention to. Uh, but when you look at how is it that churches are able to sustain themselves, okay? So Latino Protestants are actually more highly engaged in their churches than Latino Catholics um, and Latino mainline. They, they, are, they tend to be people who um, go to church more often, uh, go to church uh, not just on Sunday, so they're participating in other smaller group things. They tend to, to be more actively engaged in supporting their congregations. So that means that they're much more engaged in an active congregational life and all the things that come with it. Now, in order to survive as a church today, you have to find uh, sponsors, uh, an ability to sort of a Put yourself in relationship to other people who agree with you and can support you. And, and among Latino uh, evangelicals, of course, that's going to be white evangelicals. Why? Because white evangelicals, by and large, have more money to share than compared to, of course, their Latino brethren, as well as all of the materials. They have Sunday school materials. They have printing. They have music sources they have yeah, um, facilities have certainly they have facilities so there are a lot of uh, things that are infrastructure to making church happen that would accommodate uh, latino evangelicals more easily 
uh, than other uh, frames of orientation. So because mm -hmm. of that, I think that many Latino evangelicals, in the same way that many white evangelicals are the same, they participate in a religious life that is conservatively oriented in ways that they may not recognize is affecting their politics. So because mm -hmm. it just becomes the presumed aspect of what the culture is. So again, if the great, great majority of Latino evangelicals in the United States um, are, are needing to find a way to sustain their faith, then they're going to align themselves with what seems to be the most obvious thing, and that's going to be white evangelicals. And that mm -hmm. means that they are going to be drawn into circles of trust, relationship, as well as a, a sharing of sources that's going to introduce them and absorb them into their politics. So yeah. the generalized argument um, that I'm making here is that, of course, nobody lives in a vacuum and white evangelicalism, we are getting better, better in understanding the way these things have been developing over the past century. Uh, but the increase in Latino migration, those people who are converting to evangelicalism, they are disaffiliating with Catholicism or they come to the United States already uh evangelical or already christian that these people are finding themselves in relationship with white evangelicalism and that means that they are being brought into their politics and as they then pursue what it means to be an american their best understanding of being an american is going to be absorbed into things like the christian nationalist narratives that are being purported in a lot of our white evangelical churches yeah well and and even the 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 congregation leaders themselves, they've got, you know, the 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 market incentive for them is easier um, in, in, to get started. If you want to be a pastor and you don't have any money, um, you don't, you know, whether you're an immigrant or not, you, if you want to, you, you have a passion for it, it's a lot harder um, just to have, to get started, you, you know, to show up at a Methodist congregation and say, hey, you know, I know a lot about the Bible and I'd like to preach. Um, you know, they'll say, well, oh, that's nice. Um, right. Maybe you can be a Sunday school teacher um, or something like that. And, you know, that's not what a lot of people want to hear. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, maybe we can point you over to this theology school. Uh, and whereas in the evangelical world, you know, it's, it's very uh, entrepreneurial based. Um, and then you, that's why also it does, independently of race, you know, move to a more uh, entrepreneur, you know, a business focused uh, political manifestation because the culture itself is sustained through entrepreneurship. And so it's the only framework that they really understand and have seen. And that's yeah. a big contrast to Catholicism or, or mainline Protestantism. Yeah, completely agree. Again, Robert Schuller is a great um, example for this kind of work because not only did Robert Schuller model this and purport this and establish a school of leadership based on spreading his notions of how these things work, um, his own Crystal Cathedral had a Spanish congregation with one of the most famous uh, Latino evangelists um, in the world who headed it up. Uh, they grew and they were for a quite a while larger than the um, sort of mother congregation itself, but they were ever, never able to raise the same kind of funding. They were never able to have the same kind of revenue. And therefore, when the Crystal Cathedral eventually imploded in 2010, there was no way they could purchase uh, the building or take over the building in any way because um, the percentage that they um, had in revenue and compared to what the costs were to keep these things up was just so huge. That congregation still continued to exist. It moved somewhere else. It rented other space, uh, which again manifests the vitality of Latinidad. But you have a sense in which the Latinos do not feel like they can stay within particular denominations if financially they cannot uh, toe the line on the expectations of a building or other things that are there. Uh, and instead, they will participate in networks uh, that uh, consist of conference calls or attending different things and really being able to cultivate uh, different affinities and different relationships and therefore be able to get a hold of different kinds of materials and advice um, that doesn't depend on only denominational lines, right? It'll be anybody who's willing to connect with this thing, uh, which really opens it up and allows them to feel like they are a vibrant part 
of the American Christian community. Um, and that American Christian community is one that I think, again, uh, to get to our point, I think together, is, is coming attendant with uh, a set of political imperatives. Um, and those political imperatives are always going to be there in some way because not only with Latinos and Latino immigrants, uh, but also other non-white immigrants in the United States always bear the burden of showing themselves to be legitimately American. And so the research that's emerging now um, that is not just about um, Latinos, which is something that I and, and some other colleagues have done, but we also see now research happening among Asian populations, those that also came out of the 1965 shift in immigration policy um, that welcomed refugees and were willing to um, give them visas uh, based on work and other and education as well as family reunification. That swell of Asian Americans, they came with the same issues. How do we fit into America? How do we take the Christianity uh, that we brought with us and accommodate it to an American system? And so the only um, or the most viable models that they had available to them, the ones that were most public and the ones that were most pressing, are ones that, again, are based largely in some form of Christian nationalism, yeah. which allows them to adopt a Christian nationalist stamp standpoint, which now it continues to develop to essentially Trump support. So it's very interesting because there seems to be an irony that most people would take on. Why would uh, these people who you would think would not support this kind of person or these kinds of policies do that? Well, it's because it fits into a much larger narrative that is being uh, portrayed at the same time. And I believe that it's largely for them the only politics that they recognize. So for them, it's just the way to be American. It's not really yeah. uh, it's not really something different than that. Yeah, well, and it, and, and it touches on, you know, the, I think there has been, you know, a, a, a fair amount of, of research and discussion about the notion of whiteness as a concept. Um, but this is you know, obviously we're talking about people who are obviously not white um, and, and would not be considered white uh, by any definition for the most part. Um, so, but it, it, it basically shows that there's a, there's a subset here, which is American, uh, Americanness or American identity. Um, and that's, it's something that I think to some degree people on the political left have not noticed that as much. So like, for instance, I saw uh, there was a, a Washington Post article that came out several months ago that was, they were, they were trying to make the point to talk about multiracial whiteness. Uh, and, and people just, you know, were, they laughed at the headline. And even though it wasn't, you know, it was in line with what, what I just was talking about, the way that they expressed it uh, was not very um, accurate to the viewpoints of many people. Well, to this point, there is new research that I was reading just the other day that talks about um, Latinos who vote for Trump are actually affiliating closer with being white. And so that yeah. uh, that sense of what whiteness means, the uh, sort of malleability of whiteness and who's willing to adopt whiteness, um, that, that ends up being a very real thing when we look at the Latino uh, vote. And so here again, we're talking about Latino Protestants who they're typically associated with. Well, it's having consequences in, in the boxes that they tick off when it mm -hmm. comes to identifying themselves by a racial group. So it is yeah. complicated. It's not readily straightforward. And it certainly complicates the ability to gather data and to discern what's going on with this data. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there is an undeniable shift going on and that there's an undeniable affiliation that's going on. And it both has to do with whiteness and it has to do with um, conservative or Republican politics. And once we are willing to open the door to acknowledge that there is diversity among the Latino vote and to see where that diversity is being sourced from and therefore who is now mobilizing to galvanize that vote, then I think we start to get smarter about understanding the, the religious dynamics that are happening uh, among Latinos and the consequences that it has for our politics. Yeah, well, and it, uh, now what about in terms of um, 
you know, language differences uh, with regard to Latino Protestants versus non-Protestants. Yeah, this is and, a great, and immigration status. Sorry, those two. No, together. no, yeah, this is a great point. And what what we find is that there is a great deal of push among Latinos to really be able to speak English and to speak English well. And so we find a surprising. I don't have the numbers in the, in front of me, but there's a surprising number of of Latinos or Hispanics who are speaking English at home and and who are quite comfortable and confident with the language. And so when we think about Spanish or the need to be um, uh, appeal to Spanish, uh, it, it's a smaller proportion, I think, than we typically uh, imagine. The other complication is to recognize that when we get to language issues in Spanish, we have to also remember that there are dialect uh, dialect differences so that the way in which things are expressed by a Mexican-American, Chicano, or Puerto Rican, or Cuban, or any number of other uh, Latino things, you, you find that there are little nuances. So it is entirely possible that a person may believe that they are doing the work to mobilize people in Spanish, but they may only be speaking to Tejanos at the Mexican border, because that form of Spanish is not one that's resonating with all Latinos equally. So yeah, and it can be as simple just as a a, a, a word like you yeah. know the word coraje, like that means very different things uh, to to different people, and it's you know and and you could go on for any number of words. <laughs> so the so the attempt to really be able to be smart about these things, if we're if if our goal is to try to achieve some form of affective resonance. You can't just decide that you speak Spanish and automatically you're going to be speaking to all of these people. I think you you have to get um, a, a lot a lot more smarter about those things, and in some ways it may be safer, quote unquote. Um, maybe that's not the right word, but the idea of using someone who is themselves Latino but still speaking in in English to be able to address these issues and have enough exposure to the different circumstances that people have. I mean, you also have to uh, recognize that for a lot of people, you know, what I'm calling family value politics, the idea that you work, you know, uh, men work, women uh, are at home, you're raising your children, sort of like that um, uh, normative sense of what a traditional family looks like. That, that That is a strong level of conservatism and essentially libertarianism that's also influencing uh, these Latino voters, and they don't even realize that it's falling into these narratives, but those narratives are one that uh, tend to convey um, a more conservative standpoint. So there's a tougher road to hoe if you decide to uh, focus on things uh, like gay and, uh, gay and lesbian, you know, LGBT plus kinds of issues. There's a certain kind of sophistication and understanding that needs to be brought to being able to talk about uh, what it means to be queer in America and the, and the political consequences of that, uh, because those th issues for most Latinos are very hot in their own homes. Also, if we're only focusing on things like Black Lives Matter, um, you, you have to recognize that we have a long history of intentional antagonism that's been built uh, between so many Latinos and so and so much of the African-American community. Uh, of course, I'm not factoring in this idea of the Afro-Latino uh, people who come either from Cuba or, Puerto Rico or other the Dominican Republic. That, that's a whole other kinds of thing. But our black um, oriented American centered civil rights discourse doesn't automatically speak to the issues of the life circumstances or the resonances that are true for a lot of Latinos born in America or, or Latinos who immigrated to America. Um, and some of them came built in with prejudices that are continuing to be fed uh, because um, they're trying to make it. And if they adopt the standpoint of I work hard, I, I, I hope to make it, I'm going to be a success someday. Um, uh, and then they look at African-Americans and they say, we don't understand why you don't work hard too and can't seem to make it what's going on. They devolve into a very nasty form of racism because they can only attribute it to um, uh, all these racist notions that are readily available to them, that there's something wrong with the African-Americans uh, in the United States and they mm -hmm. can't make it the way I know I will be able to make it. Right. So that. Yeah. Well, and. Yeah, and I'm sorry. The no, no, yeah, no. the idea, the the faith in the American dream, belief exactly. in the American dream, is yeah. so core to the Latino uh, identity, uh, probably more than almost anything else. 
uh, from a political standpoint. But it, I see that so rarely discussed in in by political consultants. Um, uh, I, now, Republicans actually talk about it to some degree. I don't see uh, Democratic consultants or pundits talk about it very much. Hmm. Do you do you agree with that? Uh, I, as far as I know, them. I just think that there is a sense in which there is a civil rights tradition that is uh, certainly distinctive to particularly the Mexican-American experience. Uh, certainly, we know that Puerto Ricans have a sort of civil rights uh, discourse and connection to understanding their own issues in relation to the United States. Uh, those things are certainly there, but it is obscured by a lot of other talk. And um, and uh, most Latinos do not have access to the learnings from uh, those things, those generational things that happen, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, for the most part, the most famous ones. And they and most Latinos do not have access to the black radical tradition. Uh, they've never heard of someone like Frederick Douglass. You know, they only have a passing acquaintance with something uh, like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer or, you know, even uh, Dr. King. So those those things just don't really connect with them. Um, the, the 1965 uh, immigration change, if we contextualize it, we have um, Latino immigrants from Latin America and come, coming to the United States believing that they can achieve success at the same time that the civil rights movements are occurring. And so what you have in some ways, and this is speculation on my part, but I believe that you have Latino immigrants who come with such high ideals and aspirations and promises. Certainly that true that was true of the Cuban Americans that were brought with the uh, executive order from uh, Kennedy in 1963. They were brought with idealism, with promises, and uh, in the case of Cubans, concrete financial resources. And so they had no life circumstances to resonate with the continued oppressions and the fight that um, Black Americans were having as the civil rights movement was taking off, you know, SNCC and and uh, all the other developments that happen, um, movements in Mississippi and Alabama and the South, that's not where Latinos were going. So Latinos who are go moving into the Southwest or moving up to New York or Chicago, they are so distant to what they see as a Southern Black racist problem uh, that they just do not seem to understand the fundamental issues of racism that occur in the United States and the way our politics have been shaped by that. So instead, by tying into white Christian nationalism, a white Christian libertarianism, and a promise of the American dream, as you mentioned, then that's what really has colored so much of their politics and moves them, I think, mm -hmm. in a much more conservative direction overall. Yeah, well, and even the, you know, the slogan, Black Lives Matter, you know, it's not, it is not implicitly obvious what it means. Right. Um, and so if you're, you know, an English second language speaker or, you know, you're not uh, well educated, it actually can be difficult to understand the, the underlying um, implications there that they do not exclude uh, people of whatever race you might happen to be. Um, and it and it's a and it is an issue uh, that I've seen. You know, when you look at polling, that you see there is you know the support for Black Lives Matter among Latinos has declined over mm. time. Mm, 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 mm. Um, yeah, and so uh, but to to go back to um, something you, you mentioned briefly earlier about the idea of. Uh, um, white evangelical affiliated. Um, churches or denominations doing missionizing in the Spanish-speaking world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the key figures who recently actually passed away last year, uh, Luis Palau, um, mm -hmm. was very, very big in that regard. But mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how, how, how some of these um, denominations have, have linked up with Latino um, ministers and preachers and to spread their their version of Christianity inside mm -hmm. Latin mm -hmm. America. Well, well uh, the the existence of Protestantism among Latinos is, has a surprisingly long history. I mean, it goes back to the early 19th century uh, because of the deliberate attempt of um, white Americans to missionize in the un unincorporated areas of the United States. So it was a civilizing mission in much the same way as we see them doing with Native Americans 
Uh, so it was westernizing them, and we use this term loosely, but you know, the idea of clothing them, bathing them, teaching them how to speak and act correctly, establishing schools, all of those things occurred among um, these uh, sort of Mexican uh, American or, uh, or Tejano people in the Southwest region, establishing churches and attempting then to move them towards indigenous leadership quickly. So we have long-term uh, Latino Methodists. We certainly have um, uh, other other uh, groups. And then in terms of California in particular, uh, we see that there was a multiracial movement asso associated with the Zusa revival. Um, you do have some, some leadership happening among Pentecostal groups. It's just unfortunate that much of uh, Pentecostalism has been shown to also participate in the racism that we would uh, just expect in the United States. And that racism actually deliberately hindered the leadership of people of color in some of the established denominations. So while Pentecostalism itself may have spread, it tend to uh, be more along the lines of individual congregations who struggled for resources more so than sponsored by a denomination. It just took a long time for that to take place. Then in terms of these other offices of large denominations, all of them usually establish some group that says, we need to reach out to this group, we need to reach out to this group, uh, but it is a very small number of people overall. The dollars tend to be small and they also don't tend to be dedicated to particular groups. So let's say you have an office that deals with uh, sort of like outreach in general. Well, that person is going to be responsible perhaps for all Latino ministries, but also all black ministries, also maybe women's ministries. So or there's a lot immigrant of ministries in as well. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So that in actually hurts in terms of being able to pay attention to their particular issues, which leads a lot of um, uh, leaders of color. And if we focus on Latino, let's say Latino leaders of color um, in these denominations to feel that they do not have as much authority. Um, as much discretion and certainly not as much money, financial support in relation to the larger uh, denomination. And, and so they're constantly having to play catch up to both justify their ministries, to justify what they're doing, their plans or their initiatives, but also constantly having to ask for more funding to be able to do exactly those things. Uh, and the ability to be self-supporting is just simply much harder if it's going to be a homogeneous Latino population for the most part. So uh, the largest Latino churches, there aren't very many of them, but we would consider a church that's 500 or over to be quite large when we're talking about Latino only churches in the United States. The great majority of them would be less than 100, you know, maybe mm -hmm. 50 even, yeah, maybe 12, you know, that's that's the way that looks. Um, and so that's really the, the part of the difficulty in understanding what is the relationship that's going on. Um, some are sponsored relationships, uh, but a number of them have tried to go on their own and to be able to go on their own is inevitably going to be me mean that they're probably going to be smaller. And um, you shouldn't be surprised if you see three, four five different Latino congregations really all within a mile or two of each other, uh, because mm -hmm. it, it, it will be about the concentration of Latino populations in different neighborhoods. Um, that may happen across uh, the United States. Yeah, um, well, and then the the role of, of broadcast and internet media is actually very important with regard to Latino Protestantism. And, and again, the, to Luis Palau, he had three radio shows, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at, before he died. And one, you know, one was in English and two were in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, for, for people who have a different, you know, an odd work schedule and outside of business, regular business hours, or they have to drive a lot. That's correct. Um, or, you know, have to work on Sundays. I mean, the, 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 the traditional uh, cookie cutter, you know, mainline or, or Catholic um, ministries are not well suited to, to people who live that kind of a lifestyle. And, and whereas, you know, if you're driving 40 miles for your job, uh, and you can turn on the radio and, you know, you can do your church in, in the radio or in, on the car, in the car. Um, and, and so that's, I think, also probably been influential as well. for the I, I, I agree. I'd also add that some of the larger uh, of the evangelical churches have been able to 
dubbed their services in Spanish. So even though the original message may not have been given in Spanish, they might hire a translator to have the message dubbed, which then allows a further outreach for the largest of the evangelical churches and creates that further alignment. And there's there's uh, the accessibility of it and also the quality of it. You know, the production quality um, is, is going to be uh, pretty, pretty good. So from that standpoint, that also extends a, a reach. Uh, but here I pointed out because these are not Latino leaders who are being placed on social media or through uh, Internet or other ways. Uh, it's it's actually white leaders, white male uh, evangelical leaders who are being able to find ways to accommodate a Spanish speaking audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. And uh, it's less effective um, compared to when it's bottom up. And again, yeah, as, as we were saying, that it's it's just so much easier to be a, an entrepreneurial minister in, in the even unaffiliated evangelical world. Um, now, one of the other things that you talk about in your article is the idea of um, acceptance of inequality um, as, a, as a religious tenet. Um, now, that's it, it's a why don't you maybe just uh, summarize that for for the audience and, and then maybe talk about what you mean by that? Well, um, I think that uh, I was very influenced in some of the readings that I had, particularly Enrique Dussel and some other uh, of these writers who come from Latin America. And um, I, I, I think that there's a lot to say about people who enter into a system that's already established, uh, meaning that you enter into a wage labor system in which you, in order to make it, the goal is to get a job and to do your job well. So the acceptance that you are inevitably going to work for someone else really orients an entire way of life that says, my goal is to get a good paying job. Your hope is that it's a stable job, but it's essentially a good paying job that's going to be based on uh, wage labor. Now, the reason why that's consequential is because I think that we all know, anybody who's studied wealth in America knows that the way in which you attain wealth and get better stability in terms of wealth is to find ways to be able to get assets, right? Assets that will grow and build aside from whatever you might earn in pay. For the great majority of Americans, that's home ownership. Uh, and then attended to that would be perhaps some kind of retirement account or other kinds of investments as you can. Uh, but we know uh, that home ownership, uh, let alone any other kind of investment wealth, is just so low. And the ability to understand financial systems, let alone participate in financial systems, the bar is very high. So I, I, the way I see that is that there is an implicit understanding uh, that uh, that many Latinos, uh, most Latinos have, that they are going to participate in a system of inequality, that they are people who are going to have to work for a living and that they hope to be able to have enough stability over time uh, to be able to uh, maintain their families and perhaps maybe as a dream uh, retire. Uh, but that means that they are they are uh, consumers. Um, they are not investors. Um, it also means that they are producers, but they're not necessarily owners. And so the orientation is perhaps there's an exceptional moment when they've heard of someone or they ha may have, uh, you know, a distant friend of some sort who was able to make it, who has a miracle story to tell, um, who was able to somehow get the right combination of things to be able to get there. Uh, but I think that it's always spoken of as an exception. Um, as something that's out there and perhaps even someone who could potentially be a patron of some sort who could help them in some way. But most of them accept the system that we have in place, which means that they accept the system of inequality that is there and just try to manage and do the best they can within that. Mm -hmm. Well, now, how does that um, does that differ, though, among um, Catholic or unaffiliated? Um, well, because... Latinos? Yes, I, I, I get I get exactly what you're saying. It isn't necessarily different, but it is it becomes a more God ordained thing. So so it's it, it's built into the virtue of what it means to be a good Christian. And so a good Christian is a good worker and a good worker is one that participates in the system. It doesn't question the system. The biggest difference that we have there is uh, the the Catholic tradition has a very strong 
um, social justice dimension, um, you know, Dorothy Day, others. And so uh, uh, Catholicism and the leaders of Catholicism, especially a great deal. Uh, of and people, especially in the, the, the Latin America. I was world. just going to say, yeah, yeah, exactly. Down in Latin America, we have people who have recognized in a theological way that there are systems of oppression. Um, and, and that there is economic difference and therefore a need for economic justice, and that these come out of historical developments of economic systems. In contrast, in the United States, the winning out of libertarians, um, which happened about the 1950s, uh, stemming from things in the early, in the 30s, uh, people that are fed by things like uh, Friedrich Hayek um, or Milton Friedman, uh, those kinds of libertarian things, they actually believed that Christianity was going to be a way of helping uh, to um, domesticate um, and properly orient um, immigrants to the system, um, to workers to the system, but particularly immigrants. And they worked very aggressively in Latin America to establish these things and to align themselves with a Christianity that was friendly to capitalism. So the capitalist friendly orientation that became a religious orientation is something that we know uh, was established in American Christianity and accentuated greatly in the 1950s when we put, you know, um, in God we trust on our money and put in God we trust um, in, in Congress, in the halls of Congress. So those things were not always there. So that surge of trying to marry libertarian impulses as an appropriate um, Christian and devotional response um, happened at the same time as the surge in Latin American uh, immigration came, right? So you have developments that are happening in Latin America, you have people being pushed out, but the same uh, libertarian initiatives that were being fought over in Latin America are in turn and ironically being adopted in coming to the United States on the hope that in the United States, this dream, if you will, will actually work. It, it can actually happen. So mm -hmm. I think that there's a very interesting connection between immigration processes, um, religious developments, and the general political economic talk. Um, and Ronald Reagan was a great exemplar for bringing all of these things together. Um, because he appeared to be pro-immigration, um, um, and there's a lot bigger history at, uh, to that. He appeared to also be pro-Christianity, which ended up being a conservative Christianity. Um, and he also was pro-libertarian uh, policies, liberating credit uh, uh, globally and being able to reduce taxes. And right, and he was a glamorous and you know that's right, uh, that's right, kindly figure, and somebody who was known, you know. Yeah, outside of the United States. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. But we but we don't really know that Reagan is sort of a build off of Goldwater, which had already rejected the civil rights platform a long time ago. Reagan mm -hmm. was never really sympathetic to uh, black issues. We know that out of his politics. And we know that his Christianity was was very much dovetailed into a particular political initiatives. And in terms of the economic um, uh, solutions that were being proposed, we know that this had to do with the winning out of libertarianism because of particular circumstances of inflation and the way that they chose to fight inflation in the mm -hmm. 1970s, which utterly discredited uh, sort of like the Great Society program that Lyndon Johnson has established in the in the 60s. So uh, there's a lot of really interesting things that happened in the political development of the United States, especially political conservatism, and, and uh, being able to recognize that the surge of let Latinos who come to the United States and the surge of Protestantism that was attended to that in American uh, among American Latinos that also dovetailed at that moment. We have the makings of what we are seeing as manifestations today, um, uh, both for white evangelicals in terms of Trump support. But now we're we're seeing it in this other intriguing development, which is the increase in the proportion of Latino Protestants and their alliance um, their uh, their alignment with white evangelical politics. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and in a lot of ways, this is basically just a, a repetition of what happened with white mainline uh, Protestants. So the the, the uh, evangelical uh, you know theology just ate away at their membership, uh, and they converted over a lot of people over to their particular brands of Christianity and. 
the mainline number has declined, and and um, and so and now we're seeing with Latinos, the, the the Catholic Church is sort of the the church that's being taken away from, um, and in in by a more entrepreneurial um, evangelical conservative tradition, and the other thing also is that. Um, you know, be, just besides the institutional standpoint, is that from a, a doctrinal standpoint, the the missionizing that uh, the Southern white evangelicals were doing, it was heavily um, it was heavily co opted or grown within by this idea of Christian nationalism through the work of, of people like R.J. Rushduni and uh, you know, and more recently the New Apostolic uh, Reformation movement, um, things like that excuse me, um, things like that. And basically, you know, creating a theological, a full scale theological framework for libertarian economics. And explicitly it is libertarian, it's not conservative. Um, and it's, you know, minimal government. Yeah, and, and so in a lot of ways, the, all these, you know, you, you got all these forces in different directions that are, yeah. are all prodding Latino Protestants over to the right. Um, and so it should be no surprise that this is happening. And yet, I don't feel like that this dynamic is being noticed very much uh, in, in, in the press or even in academia. And that's part of why you wrote your, your essay. Yes. And uh, the other thing that, um, I mean, we're implying this, but also prosperity theology or word of faith theology that's building into this as well. So to the extent that you see Latinos participating in Pentecostalism, many of them also are participating in a particular theological system, which again, does not question the economic system that we have. It just, uh, it just says, well, you need to be the right kind of person in order to succeed. And, and therefore mm -hmm. God will bless you if you do the right kinds of things. So it's just, yeah. And so success, you. sorry, that success is not just a fluke or somebody succeeding, uh, you know, by luck or, or uh, it is a literal God creation. Uh, That's right. God did this for you and That's he can right. do, you know, for this person here and he can do it for you as well. That's right. That's right. That's if right. If you just right. live by, live right and pray. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm sorry. So you were saying, so the, um, uh, the, this phenomenon still, though, I don't feel like has been studied. So like in a lot of the polling that's been done, I mean, you have the the issue that, you know, having a, a sufficient uh, sample size of Latinos just period of any of any ethnicity is, is difficult in and of it's expensive in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then being able to differentiate between the different subgroups, you have to spend even more money uh, in order to have an adequate uh, framework uh, to understand how the different populations are are differing from each other, and so uh, these are, the, and then and then of course you got the language um, barriers in many cases that a lot of pollsters. If I mean that's another you have to pay for people who can speak Spanish in, in addition to English, yes. um, and so yeah. Yeah. these are uh, these are all things that that have probably you know led to a lack of understanding of it. But also, I would you say that there's just a you know, a lack of familiarity with religious, um, religio political concepts within people who, who do political science or, or journalism. Well, for the most part, you know, I think we're all trying to get smarter. And it's interesting that the last four or five years has really pressed us to get smarter about certain kinds of things. I think even to like today, we wouldn't just say Christian as a whole. I think that we are now more attuned to certain differences. Um, I was very impressed when PRRI deliberately decided to ask uh, questions uh, about QAnon, QAnon beliefs, you know, which may be fringe um, and may not be the majority, but there's enough people that we should be asking. And can we ask those questions and be able to get good information? PRRI is among the few who's, who are willing to do that kind of work. When it comes to Latinos, I think that it is well past time to be able to do something that is focused on the Latino population of the United States and that we make sure that we not just focus only on, so to speak, political uh, questions and attitudes, but also make sure and ask some religious oriented ones, because if religion appears to be the driver just remembering that religion is fueled by um, not only the notion of a sacred identity, something that you're connected to in relation to God, but also a sacred community, right? A group of people who are surrounding you and 
of shaping you and maybe even disciplining you to make sure that you uh, say and do the right kinds of things. Um, so if you have a poll that has maybe a generous, now maybe 2000 is a pretty generous number uh, by some standards, but if only 10% of that are Latinos, you just don't have enough to be able to authoritatively say, here's what's going on among the Latino population. Um, we have to accept the heterogeneity of Latinos in America. We need to also accept the heterogeneity, not just of their um, ancestral or national backgrounds, but also the diversity of the religious orientations that they have. And so from there, then I think we might actually be better equipped to understand where things are and over time be able to see how those changes are happening over time. Uh, because all of these phenomena are fairly new. I mean, I really understand why somebody may, may not have paid attention to this in the right way. Uh, it's because really the surge of Protestantism is really a very recent phenomenon. Uh, but it is having already very important consequences. So in that sense, I do think it's past time for us to be able to pay attention to exactly these kinds of things and to solicit the right amount of information so that we can be more confident about what we think is going on. Yeah. Well, and and, and the reality is that, you know, with uh, religious disaffiliation among white Americans and the drift, <clears throat> excuse me, the drift of, of, of white evangelicals into mainline Protestantism, uh, these, you know, these conservative evangelical congregations have by necessity, if they wish to continue to exist at or above the level that they're currently bringing in revenue, they have to do Latino outreach. Yeah, agree, which is why I think that there are some churches um, in terms of like white churches and white evangelical churches that have unapologetically moved to a more conservative agenda because what they they know whether they know it from research or not they they know that uh conservative political uh white people are the most religious they are the ones who have the greater propensity to be in a church to participate in ministries to financially support it and and so uh being apolitical or to have to feign that you have no politics is an attempt to try to keep everybody together. Um, but what ends up happening is you are offending those who are most politically active because they expect you to toe the line in particular ways. Um, and the uh, outreach to people who are more, um, you know, open on a number of different things, being welcoming and affirming of, of uh, gay, lesbian, trans, or to be able to be more explicit about dealing with racial justice, issues of racial justice in the world, uh, or other things like that it is a very difficult thing to do. Um, it's difficult because, again, for the most part, those who are most resonant with those themes have already walked away from religion a long time ago. So those people are not likely to participate in your church just because you have political attitudes or social attitudes that resonate with what, what they do. It's really about uh, trying to foster something among those Christians who have come to question uh, so much of the of what they grew up with or uh, so much so much of what's around them in their families or in their communities. Um, mm -hmm. So there is it's very hard to tell. OK, but we certainly have more uh, Christians who have been walking away from conservatism, who are unwilling to accept the marriage of Christianity with a form of Christian nationalism or a particular interpretation of patriotism. Um, and there are more Christians who are resonating uh, with uh, we, of course, we need to be more accepting and and uh, and open to those who have different uh, sexuality uh, and approaches to their sexuality, understandings or living out their sexuality in different ways. And of course, we need to be attuned to the racialized oppressions that are continuing today, uh, because to put a blind eye to that certainly does not take it away. It's it's persistent, uh, uh, but it is not yet fully the majority. And certainly among evangelicals, it is far from the majority. So this in and of itself becomes for pastoral leadership, who, again, is my often my focus. It, it becomes a real difficult endeavor of how do I lead a congregation in which some people are begging me to do more and are really, really resonating with these kinds of things and a strong uh, proportion of people who are actively against it 
and are organizing against it and really want to get rid of me <laughs> um, as a pastor in this place. If I um, talk about it, yeah. That's right. So the pastoral um, ministry is really challenged uh, in our political settings, um, which, again, either brings people who just kind of resonate with sentiments and go with it, or, or the people who are really trying to manage it in some mm -hmm. way and be open, which I think is untenable over time. Uh, and those who are saying, I'm willing to address it, but I may not survive here. I mean, it survived even in my own mental health, you know, even in terms yeah. of how I understand myself and my family. Yeah. Well, and I would say that, you know, one of the, I, one of the answers, one of the biggest answer probably is to look to what, let's say Episcopalians or, or, uh, or the Jewish communities have done, which is to open up church or synagogue as a, to 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 say you don't we are not going to demand that you believe x about you know certain theological concepts so like if there's within a lot of uh synagogues in america there are, are people who will go to synagogue and they're atheists and and the synagogue accepts that uh and says you know we're not going to expect you to we're not going to make you sign a loyalty pledge or a doctrinal uh, creed or anything like that. Um, and, and the Episcopal Church to some degree has done that as well. And it, I would think that if, if people who do have faith, you know, faith leaders who do have these more progressive perspectives, they're going to have to do something like that. Well, uh, it, it may be true, but you happen to hit on things that are a very, very small proportion of American religion, you know, so you may you may be right and or that may be have have some validity. But I will say that those and, and uh, Unitarians would be another, for example, um, just a tiny, tiny proportion of American religious life. Um, the Alliance of Baptists, uh, who Baptists being in the name is the. Uh, well, you would think that they're conservative, but actually they're uh, definitely amongst the most progressive uh, churches in America, uh, very white in terms of their overall demographic currently. Uh, but they are not uh, by far the largest of the Baptist denominations in the United States. And their willingness, many of these churches willingness to take on exactly the kind of orientation that you suggest is not something that's necessarily winning people over. Um, so the, the, the great successes currently in American religious life are definitely among the conservatives, definitely non-denominational who are not beholden to a particular denominational body and almost entirely evangelical. So those are the groups that are, quote unquote, winning at the moment. Um, but what, what that means is too often Christianity is affiliated with conservatism and we are losing um, any cognizance that there even was a, an alternative Christianity that was more progressive in nature or that it exists today. And so there is a viable American Christian tradition uh, that uh, that resisted uh, slavery, right, who actually had uh, a concern for those who are the poorest and oppressed um, and who even today are continuing to address some of the hardest issues. Um, but they are, they've never been in the majority. And um, those are the things that um, it's almost uh, amazing the way they continue to innovate and, and really attempt to exercise their ministries. I have a great deal of respect uh, for those who are attempting to live uh, a deep Christian faith, but it is one that often runs against the dominant uh, form of American Christianity. Um, so we would do a lot for our democratic system to recognize that there are indeed uh, other Christians, uh, the Christians who have a long history, as long a history, maybe longer history, um, but have been people who did not uh, fall into the kinds of um, ugliness or the weird kinds of patriotism and partisanship that we have today, uh, the a willingness to accept violence um, as a form of being able to assert uh, the policies and the particularities that they think are most important. Um, there is indeed a different Christianity out there. Uh, and so in part, it might be helpful for people to realize um, that um, it's not like Christianity or nothing that there are actually other forms of Christianity, as well as, of course, Islam, um, uh, Jewish, you know, there are other religious orientations, of course, but that there are other religious orientations that allow you uh, to have a vibrant uh, spiritual life, but one that can participate in a pluralist democracy, and one that can pursue the, you know, the ambitions uh, of what America can be.
Yeah. Well, and and it's it's actually a, a more long-standing tradition, as a matter of fact. I mean, all these uh, you know this these evangelical fundamentalism that we're talking about, this fundamentalism, you know, it it was it's a mid twentieth century creation. I mean, nobody believed or had had even heard of the rapture <laughs> at the beginning of the twentieth century. Uh, it was just not a concept. Nobody believed it. Um, and the notion that the Bible was, you know, a hundred percent literally true in every um, word, that was not a that was not a common belief. Um, it was certainly not a majority belief. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so uh, just to uh, wrap up here, so has you uh, were trying to spark some research by writing your article? Um, has what kind of uh, has anybody told you about projects that you had inspired them to to begin? Well, the, the the article just came out really just a few weeks ago, so it's still in, in brewing, uh, but there are certainly many who are already doing research or acquainted with the Latino community in the United States in all different ways, and uh, all of them have affirmed that the things that uh, I'm, I'm writing about are indeed true. They see evidence of it uh, based on uh, the exposure that they have, um, and that in and of itself is very gratifying. Um, uh, I also myself have been digging into what is the best data that might be available today to suss out these things. And so far, uh, based on, you know, very sophisticated statistics, um, I'm able to bear out um, exactly these dynamics um, that Latino Protestantism is increasingly aligning with um, support for Trump and the things that we associated uh, with uh, Trump and the GOP. Uh, we also see that um, church membership only amplifies these sentiments. Um, so we, we see those dynamics already in uh, the further research that I'm doing. And I am confident that as others out there um, see the capacity of being able to measure these things, that it will become more of something that will be added to an analysis or perhaps a focus of analysis. It's really just about getting better data um, and every time I've done something like this, I've seen uh, things like this exactly happen. So American Blind Spot is a book that was written in order to show a trend and a sort of cultural system that was beginning to come about, trying to align political attitudes with economic attitudes, with religious attitudes. And sure enough, within a year of that book coming out, which was in 2020, by 2020, when there were already uh, analyses that were affirming this based on highly rigorous data and the most recent data we have available. So I am confident that what may seem like an innovative thought to some people today will be common sense thought very soon. Okay, well, I certainly hope so. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing some of that additional research um, and uh, getting to know some of those researchers as well. All right, well, so thanks for being here. Um, Gerardo Marti is on Twitter. Um, you'll have to explain your Twitter username because it's a philosophy <laughs> joke. Well, uh, Praxis so it's Habitus comes from Bourdieu. Uh, and so Praxis and Habitus are two forms of relating to social life. Uh, and uh, if you want to understand that even more, you read a little bit more of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, uh, who's quite famous and uh, who I was thinking about when I created my Twitter handle originally years ago now. All right. Well, so it's uh, P-R-A-X-I-S for those listening. P-R-A-X-I-S-H-A-B-I-T-U-S. Uh, so you can find him on there. All right. Well, um, so thanks. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. All right. Well, so uh, that's the program for today. Um, thank you for watching or listening. And uh, just wanted to remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. Uh, for those uh, who haven't know, who don't know about it yet, um, Flux is a uh, a new uh, organization focused on in-depth podcasts and articles that look at larger religious and political and media trends and how they all interrelate. Excuse me. So um, you can go to flux.community to check us out and uh, get on our mailing list. And then if you want to get the Theory of Change archives with transcripts and all that good stuff, uh, just go to theoryofchange.show and you can go directly to the episode archive. And if you liked what you have listened to or watched today, uh, please go to patreon.com slash discoverflux 
and help us out. We don't have any billionaire uh, backers do, backing what we're doing here. Uh, there's no corporate welfare here. Uh, no uh, George Soros or Koch Brothers money. So um, we need your help to keep producing independent programming. So again, that's patreon.com slash discover flux. All right. Well, uh, we'll see you next week. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for watching.